All right, here's another email we might be able to talk about a little bit. It'll, it'll prevent us from talking about modern wrestling for just a teench longer. Uh, this is from Anto, uh, who from Montreal. Anto? Anto from Montreal. Short for Antonino? Uh, possibly, uh, but uh, I don't want to rock her. You may. Um, hello, Jim. I've sent this into the drive through several times, but couldn't get past the Charlie from Starkville <laughs> log jam. <laughs> it has often been said that Jerry Jarrett and Jerry Lawler would take turns booking Memphis every six months. How would the transition work? Would all storylines be wrapped up before the next took over? Was the six-month period January to June and July to December, or did it vary? Any stories about angles being abruptly dropped when the new booker took over? Well, the way it would work is all the wrestlers <laughs> with European or Australian uh, backgrounds would be yeah. dropped, yes. and it said monsters would show up. <laughs> That's what would happen. No, and honestly, that was the transition from Dundee to Lawler, by the way, and not from Jarrett to Lawler, because we did the world's only eight-man tag loser-leave-town match. I lost my entire fucking stable in one night. Uh, but we're jumping ahead of ourselves. Um, I'm t I've, I've had this email for a couple weeks, and I've been wanting to try to talk about it, but it's just, it's so difficult to try to explain to not only modern fans, but also to even fans you're in my age, but who weren't smart to the business at that point in time, weren't contemporaneously involved in it, don't understand how the whole concept of what people consider booking now has changed. Um, but a couple of things to begin with. The six months was a generalization, and he says it's often been said, Jerry Jarrett said it in, in some shoot interviews, and I think Lawler may have also, but the thing I've found when talking to both Jerry Jarrett and Jerry Lawler about Memphis wrestling, even things they have, have personally done, been responsible for, I've found when you do something for 40 years, sometimes, unless you're like me and just have the fucking anal retentiveness of saving things on paper and et cetera, you, you sometimes, uh, things are lost to the fog of time. It may have seemed to them like they would take turns every six months. In actuality, it wasn't a hard six months. Uh, there was no January, June, or July, December. It was basically always dictated by Jerry Jarrett, depending on the revenue of the territory. If it started going down, it was down for a while, or Jarrett looked at the, the talent and or the, the, the shows, the things that were going on, and maybe he'd refreshed himself a little bit or he had some ideas he wanted to put in, then they would figure out a way to make a change. Um, there was the time that they brought Robert Fuller in from Knoxville, and we've told these stories, but Robert Fuller booked several months at the uh, first part of 1979. And I... I I say even then booked several months, but Jerry Lawler by that point was always really in charge of his own programs because he was the cash cow. So the booker would defer to Lawler on shit he wanted to do um, just because that was the most uh, easiest way to do things, and it worked. But when Robert Fuller finally booked the territory into almost insolvency. They were down to 3,000 people one M Monday night in Memphis, and that never happened. It it may be apocryphal, but I heard it that Jerry Jarrett looked out at that house and said, Robert, it can't get any worse. And Robert had his spit cup too, and he said, Pff, Pff. oh, yes, it can. And he was that he was done that night. Um, so then they just dropped everything, and that's when Jarrett shot the Tupelo concession stand brawl with Lawler and Dundee and Ferris and Latham because they had to start from scratch and they needed to grab everybody's attention. But with the, uh, with the booking hierarchy in Memphis, when Jarrett started his company, for example, in early 1977, he obviously started it off and got it rolling. Sometime in 78, I believe, is the first time he handed it over to Lawler for a while, even though the movie monsters, Dr. Frank was a 1976 thing. That was when they were all still working for Nick, but Lawler could always do what he wanted to do because he's 
fucking selling out everywhere. Um, but then at that point, uh, I believe it was, you could tell differences. You could tell differences in their style, even though I was not smart to the fact that there was a booker at this point from watching the show, you could tell the difference. And also business in, uh, 1979 after Lawler, after Jarrett took over from Robert Fuller immediately got better through the summer, but then was lagging. Um, uh, you know, toward the end of the year. And that's when Jarrett got more involved and started shooting separate angles in Louisville that they'd put on the Louisville TV. And he was here in the gardens more and they were running some different things in Memphis, but Lawler switched heel at that point, but then Lawler broke his leg. So then Jarrett took over the book for a little while and put Dundee in. And then finally, uh, uh, when Lawler had come back and was, was ready to go, they, the business was tremendous for a while. And then finally things started dropping a little bit and, and Jarrett took, took it back and gave it to Dundee again, which then <laughs> when, when Lawler made his power play and had already set up a whole nother crew to come in and run opposition, if he didn't get half the territory, then he already had guys coming in with a starting date. And so all of Dundee's guys had to fucking get their notice because they had to make room for the guys that Lawler was bringing in. He was the new booker. But anyway, so it wasn't just a hard and fast six months rule. More importantly, the booking. Booking was done differently in the territories depending on how the territory schedule was set up. There were weekly territories like Memphis, for example, or like most of Georgia, especially in those years, until they started running the big major northern tours. Uh, Florida, most of the towns were weekly. It, southern wrestling was set up to be weekly because they had smaller geographic territories and smaller population centers, so they wanted to have regular, steady uh, uh, gates and ticket sales from uh, their regular towns. Then you had territory, and Dallas was weekly. Uh, you had a territory like the Carolinas that was only three states, but still there were so many mid-sized markets, Charlotte, Greensboro, Raleigh, Fayetteville, Greenville, South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, Norfolk, Virginia, Roanoke, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, Hampton, Virginia, uh, Asheville, North Carolina, Johnson City, Tennessee, just in that area. They were more of, uh, in the old days, they were weekly, and then they expanded in the 70s, and a lot of the towns were run every two weeks. By the time that we got there, sometimes it was, Greenville was still every Monday night weekly, but Charlotte might run every two or three weeks, but you're at a 12,000-seat coliseum. Point is, those territories were booked a little bit differently because they had to be booked farther out. And then you had the monster geographic areas like the major northeast towns and and or Vern Gagne's AWA, those were monthly towns because they were major NBA arenas. They were distances you had to travel. Um, th those territories needed to be booked definite card lineups for towns six weeks ahead at minimum, if not longer, because they had to book all those buildings a year in advance. And they were, you know, in major markets. So the point is, everything about how you booked your territory depended on what style of schedule that your territory ran. That's why Vince Sr. not only had start dates for guys, but end dates for guys. Remember, he told Billy Graham when he won the title, he told him the date he was going to lose it, a year and what, three or four months down the line. That was a, an extreme example of pre-planning and they had a booking formula that they went through we've talked about it in depth but uh you know they'd bring a heel in and build him up on television and then he would get shots at at bruno or pedro or backland or whoever in the garden and two if he was a good heel three if he was a great heel and then they'd work their way around the rest of the territory it's very formulaic and because they had you know, major population centers, big buildings running once a month and the only game in town. They didn't have to be, they didn't shoot angles every week on TV or even every month. You very seldom saw them. Same way with Vern. 
It's why the TVs were kind of boring, but they sold tons of tickets. <clears throat> but down south, you had to get more creative because you had smaller populations, smaller buildings. You were running it much more often. They ran Memphis, Tennessee four times as often as they ran Madison Square Garden. Um, in a weekly territory, let's say, for example, in Memphis, you did the live TV on Saturday morning. And the people in Memphis saw that. And on tape, it would air a week later in all the other towns. So you have to have two weeks booked. You have to have this week and you have to have the following week. And then you're golden until you do the next week's Saturday morning television. Because then you can make any changes you want to make. Have I heard stories about angles being ab abruptly dropped? Whether a new booker took over or not, that used to be the name of the game, especially in Memphis wrestling, where they could change on a dime. But in a weekly territory, if shit wasn't working, you changed it at the next TV and you blew it off. You know how you blow it off? The baby face goes over. One, two, three, clean. The end. Because in those days, when, when the people saw the baby face get even, it was over with. Unless the heel got some heat afterwards or did something else on TV or whatever. So when you did your live TV that Saturday morning and then you'd go to the Memphis house show Monday night, you would already know what you were going to do in the finishes on the, on that card. And you would do your promos for those matches that were the, were going to be held the following week in Louisville and Evansville and Lexington and Nashville when that tape aired in those towns. And then you waited till the next Saturday morning on TV and you saw what your house was. You saw if the people were interested in what was going on and you furthered it if they were and you cut it off if they weren't. Uh, the famous story, Lawler and Dundee in 77 had gone 11 or 12 weeks in a row <clears throat> all summer. I think three or four sellouts. They drew in... 12 or 13 days, they drew about 100,000 people, 12 or 13 shows. So Jared had scheduled the hair match where Dundee would get his head shaved and Lawler would go over as the blow-off. And now people are saying, well, why is the goddamn heel going over in the blow-off? Because Lawler was then going to retire, come back six weeks later as a babyface. So there was a method there. But when they saw, we got there and they saw 10,000 people and they saw the goddamn people were going crazy for the match, Jarrett realized they'd cut it off too soon. So Dundee got his head shaved, and then as soon as he came back, Jarrett said, hey, we can bring this back. What? How? Well, Beverly won a haircut, and he put his wife's hair up the next week, and they got another fucking house out of it. But the, for conversely, there's been many more times where he would just say, this ain't working, it ain't drawn, we're going to change it, which was as simple as the baby face going over on Monday night and both people involved, whether it's singles or tag teams, getting involved with somebody else on TV the next Saturday morning. Because booking itself was not these long drawn out complicated tv formats and everybody's interacting with everybody else and it's the staginess and the backstage promo and this and that and the drama and the you know dinner theater verbiage and all this other stuff it was okay so and so's the champion so and so's the challenger we're going to have them have an argument on TV, or we're going to have them have a fight on TV stemming from something that happens, boom, boom. And then they're going to have a match. And then in the first week, the heel's going to get disqualified to save his title. So the next week, we might come back with no disqualification. Well, then the heel fucks the baby face. Then, God damn it, the baby face is mad. All right. Then, however, the baby face got fucked. If it was outside interference, then you might want somebody in your corner or you might want two referees or you, if, if I've, I've seen them do matches where the heel won one week with a foreign object. So the next week they had five fans allowed to search the heel for foreign objects before the match. That was the stipulation. 
And they would keep building it up until finally you got to the cage or the fucking Texas death match or the street fight or whatever. And you could get 10, 12 weeks out of shit like that by just increasing the stipulations based off the finish of the previous match. Or at any time, if it got old, you could just cut it off. And now people think that booking is some kind of goddamn screenwriting and and the, everything has to be written and every move and verb and, and, and everything has to be planned out ahead of time. No. <clears throat> Bookers, matchmakers were football coaches. They picked a team of talent that they knew or felt could draw money and some underneath guys to get their ass kicked. And they put them in situations with each other where they gave them the instruction. You're mad at him because he said this, or you're mad at him because he did that. Go out. And the guys would, as Dutch Mantel says, run the play. And they would get the thing over with people. And you and the booker or the matchmaker would call a finish that was designed to have some fluke or quirk or whatever that would naturally lead to a rematch that the people would want to see their hero with a fair chance to get even. And somehow he would always have stumbling blocks put in his path until finally the ultimate stipulation to take care of all the problems that he's been having would come about and he'd win. That's, <laughs> that's matchmaking. You get people that, that can draw money, that can get over as heels or baby faces. You expose them on television and establish them and play to their strengths and give them something to talk about and something to do that people will give a shit about and let them do it. And then you book matches against those people. With You're either building someone for later or you want them to have a program. So you come up then with finishes to lead to stipulations to lead to rematches that people also might care about and that's what makes the world go round and it's on and on and on you can't have fucking eight matches all with goddamn ridiculous storylines and stipulations or you've got a goddamn mess but you can't have eight just bland cold matches with name versus name regardless of how great workers they are because then nobody gives a shit. Because personal issues draw money. You have a wrestling card where you start out with wrestling and you get a little fancier and a little bigger and a little more star power along the way up until finally you got three or four matches with a some type of story behind it and one or two clear main events out of those three or four matches. And you pay the guys on top more than you pay the guys on the bottom, just like you pay the goddamn janitor a little bit less than you pay the fucking CEO in charge of the whole company. And the extras in the movies get paid a little bit less than the star. But one of these days, the extra can be a star if he's in enough movies. That's how this shit worked. It's not that fucking difficult. They've mucked it up and made it so ridiculous and complicated that now booking to people means, well, I didn't like the way they booked that match because he did three arm drags. Like a booker would ever... I don't know how long it was after I got in the business before I heard a booker specifically instruct someone in a match I was in to do a specific move. And that's only because it was part of the fucking... The, the the whole point of the finish. So it, it's not about... And, and the, as far as the storylines being wrapped up or dropped or whatever, the whole reason the storylines got started was not because somebody pitched and, oh, I think this would be so cool if we do this, or we could be the first people to have this kind of match in this country. Or, wow, wouldn't it be great that Uncle Dave might give us a bunch of stars if we have this kind of match. It was, how can I make these motherfuckers sell tickets? That's all. In terms of just the booking, would you have preferred for Smoky Mountain Wrestling to, to have been a weekly territory as opposed to pretty much every month you would go to Knoxville or, well, or different towns 
Would you have preferred if it would have been easier or harder for you if it was every week? Well, oh God, <laughs> easier or harder for me. Here's the thing. It would have been easier to book in terms of we had to do, because of the expense of television, we had to do four weeks of TV at most. A lot of TVs were three, but a lot of TVs were four. four three to four weeks of television in one taping. When you're doing that so as not to reveal anything ahead of time, you have to leave holes for VTRs to be put in of shit that hadn't happened yet. But you at the same time have to give your announcers enough of a fucking idea of what's going to happen that they can vaguely refer to it on the tape that you're doing, even though it hadn't happened yet. And then you got to go through that whole thing, and that is is difficult. At the same time, if we'd have had a weekly live television, it would have been great for for uh, uh, being easier to book and easier to keep up with and only having to do one show at a time, et cetera. But th- your problem also there is running weekly towns in that day and age. That was at a point where even Memphis wasn't drawn with that history behind it. You couldn't get them out every week anymore. And we, we, I don't, we probably, if we'd have run Knoxville weekly instead of monthly, on our average Knoxville shows, not the big major blowout shows, but just the average Knoxville house show, we probably, if we'd run weekly, would have done almost as many people as we did for the monthly show. Because those were the people that, that were there to see any wrestling that was presented, right? They were going to go to every show, our regulars. But the problem is, is that it wasn't worth any, by the time that we did a regular show in Knoxville, it, it was a break-even proposition because of the rent and the expense and the blah, blah, blah. On the big shows like Night of Legends or Super Bowl or Sunday Bloody Sunday or whatever, we can walk out of there with 20 grand in, you know, in, the, in the black. But to just have had the regular amount of people, we would have either broke even and done a lot more work or lost more money. So, and I mean, you know... <laughs> The thing about the weekly territories was before we ran them all off, we had them. It had taken people years to establish those territories back in the distant prehistory of the fucking 40s and 50s. And they kept them going weekly for decades. And then all of a sudden the wrestling business decided it was too big for its britches in 1988 and in three or four years ran every single territory out of business. And we ran those fans off when the same wrestlers three or four years later came back to the same towns and ran in the same buildings. Nobody wanted to go to see it because they'd, they'd seen the, the, the business had been exposed. They'd seen the cartoon stuff. They lost, the 90s was lost for 10 years, from 88 until the Attitude Era. The old fans went away because they they felt put upon and lied to, and they found something else to do, and they got a bad taste in their mouth about wrestling. And the wrestling that was being presented almost everywhere, WWF, WCW, was not making any new fans. When we started Smoky Mountain, we were able to get a decent portion of the fans that existed in that area to come back, but not nearly all of them. And, you know, it it, it just, the whole economics of the business changed because even during the attitude era, as hot as wrestling was, nobody was running even monthly in any city in America, much less weekly. It was, Yeah, we're hot in New York this week. We're hot in Chicago this week. We're hot in Los Angeles this week. But they weren't even running the garden more than two or three times a year. So it was a whole different thing. It was, wrestling was hot nationally, but it wasn't as hot in any specific part of the country that it had been during any time that the territories were hot. One final question. Jerry Jarrett was certainly a booking genius. Yes. Do you consider Lawler a good booker or not? I consider Lawler a good booker for himself. 
Right. <laughs> but as someone who was in charge of a whole territory for no, months no. at a time. No. And I'm and, and here's the thing with the king. Dundee was a much better booker for the territory, even though Lawler drew more money. Dundee was a workaholic. Dundee would show up first thing at Jarrett's house at the office after trips every morning. Dundee, you know, agonized over it. Dundee worked his ass off in every... And then he went out there and, and worked as hard in the ring as, as anybody else on the card. He just... That was him. Lawler was like... His thing was he would literally write the format for the Memphis TV show that was live on Channel 5 on Saturday morning in front of 300,000 people in the car with the dome light on on the way back from the Friday night spot show back to Memphis with Jerry Calhoun or somebody driving. And I mean, I've seen his, I've probably got a few of his formats around here. It was just, he'd have it in his head, but it would be Brian versus Jim seg one seg two interview, Jimmy Hart seg three Lawler versus so-and-so an interview. And then what he would do is he'd get there at 10 o'clock an hour before we went on the air. If we were lucky, because all he had to do was drive down Walnut Grove Road, and he'd call Seg 1 into the bathroom where he dressed, and he'd give him Seg 1. Here's what you're going to do and say, kind of. The idea is what you're going to say, and the finish what you're going to do, and how much time you might have. Then he brings Seg 2 in while he's putting his boots on, and then he brings Seg 3 in. It was the most laid back. And I mean, you know, just like Guy Coffey used to say, a ah, million dollar business, run like a flea market. It was run by the seat of, of his pants. He just, it was natural to him. And he he's the person who never gets upset. I've said so many times, if he's playing cards in a dressing room, they come in and said, King, the arena's on fire. Well, I guess this have to be the last hand. So, and, and, and Jerry was also, he couldn't say no to people. When people would call him and ask him if they could come in, in the summer of 1983, there was 40 guys in the Memphis territory and the opening match one night at the Mid-South Coliseum was a 10 man tag and uh, everybody got 50 bucks. But the thing is that's what Jarrett would take it away from him because he'd say, fuck, I could have spent a hundred dollars for an opening match. Instead I spent $500 and what the fuck? No, I gave a shit anyway. Cause it's a 10 man tag with 10 of 40 guys in the territory. Jerry would just, Lawler would just let you starve and leave on your own. And then he'd say, well, we hate to see you go, (laughs) but I got to go somewhere. So how Uh, do you think it would have worked out in 83? If you really had a war, if you really had Jarrett and his biggest strength, which was his booking with Bill Dundee against Lawler and Lance Russell, where their biggest strength was the star power of Jerry Lawler. And the TV. And the TV. What do you think would have happened? I, I've said this before. It killed them both. Lawler would have... St- if Lawler and, and Lance had gone with him, then they could have gotten a TV show on any station in Memphis. And Jarrett, I doubt, would have rolled over without a fight, although Channel 5 may not have been happy uh, that they lost Jerry Lawler and Lance Russell. They still had a deal with Jerry Jarrett for a television program, but what I've thought would happen is that Louisville and Evansville and Lexington and Nashville would have been mostly unchanged, except the houses would have gone down with no Lawler. Jarrett would have still been running in all those towns using the TV that he shot in Memphis, and I don't think that uh, Lawler and uh, if they could have even got TV in Louisville and those other towns like Jared already had with the Memphis show, if they could have got their Memphis show on those stations, which I don't think they probably could have done. I don't know how that would have gone, but Jared would have lost Memphis sooner than later because without Lawler, whatever Lawler did in Memphis would have, would have muddied the water and, and, taken over the whole thing there. So in in the end, everyone would have suffered. Jerry Lawler was not a great businessman, and Lance Russell, I don't think, was getting involved to be the guy running the business. Um, It would have hurt everybody, is what it would have done. So it was, it was best that they worked everything out and stayed together, because then there was no interruption in the, in the Memphis TV at all. 
uh, all the towns remained this intact, and they went on to do even bigger business for the next few years than they'd done. But it would have it would have fucked everything up eventually because Lawler needed Jarrett's business structure. Um, Jarrett needed his top star. Lance was very important to either side, uh, especially in in getting television in Memphis. But you know, sooner or later, everybody would have lost out. And Lance was almost retirement age at that point. He didn't want to start driving around 400 miles to Louisville every week. So it, it's it's best that everything stayed the way that it, it was. But in the meantime, uh, there was a lot of extra guys that needed to be ousted. But that that was the thing. Lawler just, he's just a laid back guy and he didn't want to fucking, it's natural to him. Is for the people that it's just natural to say be able to do promos or be he was the best ring general. Talk about the best booker. Bill Dundee was one of the best finish guys that I ever worked with. Jerry Jarrett was one of the best booking minds. Dusty was so creative and had all those Eddie Graham and you know fucking legendary finishes to draw from. But Lawler was the best guy at just being himself and also at calling a match in the ring with anybody to suit their style and could still get them over. Nick Bockwinkle said Jerry Lawler was the best ring general he'd been in the ring with. Imagine that. How much fucking territory that took in. But if you just, if you, even me, Jimmy Hart, whoever it was, you could be in the ring with Lawler and if you just somehow heard and picked up on that voice that he telepathically inserted into your head without really talking to you, telling you what to do, you'd be okay. That's one of the interesting things about what would have potentially been a 1983 or wrestling war. You would have had Jimmy Hart on one side and Jim Cornette on the other. <laughs> right? That would, have, that would have been interesting. Yes, I've, I've, I would have been over there on the, in the Jarrett and Dundee camp at that point. Yeah. Um. Anyway, do... <sighs> I don't even know how to explain the difference between matchmaking and what they call modern booking any more than that. But it was, it was, that's why there was only a very few people that could do it successfully. And once that they started doing it, they did it for a long period of time because it was more of a feeling of the right people to put together the chemistry of the, the matches and the angles, who's going to draw money with who, who's the best dance partner for this guy. Instead, they didn't concentrate on, I want to book a match with this stipulation. They came up with the stipulation based on where the fucking program and issue and animosity between the pr two people had, had gone. It, it, they, a lot of these carts are put before the horse these days. 